A very good evening to all the people who have joined the webinar today. And today we are going to discuss a very important issue that uh, causes a lot of inconvenience to those who are involved in buying and selling commodities, which is the volatility in commodity prices. So uh, the topic for today is how Commodity derivatives can be used for managing the volatility that comes with uh, commodity prices. And we are going to talk about uh, this risk management with examples of agri commodities. Although the same principles get applied everywhere else, wherever you have a price risk and you need to manage that. So that is what our webinar for today will focus on. My name is Dr. Neeti Nandini Chatnani, and I'm a professor of finance at the Indian Institute of Foreign Trade in New Delhi. Uh, I am also the head of alumni affairs at IFT, and I am the author of a book on commodity markets and derivatives. So it's a book that was first published in 2009. And since then, the book has, because a lot of developments have taken place in the commodity markets across the globe and also in India. So the revised edition of the book came out only in uh, 2019. So we have a very recent edition called Commodity Markets and Derivatives uh, in the market. So for those of you who are interested, there is this book uh, that I have authored. Now, uh, how commodity derivatives can be used for hedging. It's a very, very vast topic and you need to know a lot of nitty gritties about the whole subject to be able to, uh, to undertake hedging uh, with the use of commodity derivatives. My objective today, because we have a two hour session, so I'm going to do a very high level uh, explanation of how commodity hedging can be uh, practiced using derivative contracts. So it's going to be a high level discussion, but I'm sure that it will give you a very good understanding to start exploring or probing further on how you can use the derivatives which are available to you as tools for managing risk. Now uh, you can all ask me the questions you have uh, through chat. And I will attempt to uh, to answer the questions as far as possible, but I will look at the questions only after a certain gap so that we can all, uh, um, you know, progress with the uh, discussion that I have planned for today, uh, rather than get derailed by the uh, uh, by the questions. So uh, I, I think we can start now, right? We can start now. You can switch off your videos. I'm also going to switch off my video and I'm going to uh, upload my slides so that my my discussion will, uh, you know, will uh, will be supported by my slides. And then later on, we'll take questions. So I'm, that is my introduction. And uh, uh, I'm now going to upload my uh, slides so that we can start uh, right away with what we have planned for today. So. Uh, there you are. OK, this is what we are going to discuss today. Commodity hedging, a case and experience of Indian agri crops. Um, I have already given you my introduction. Uh, my e email ID is also there in case you want to write in uh, with any questions later on. So let's first begin by understanding what are commodities. Commodities are products of nature, how nature gave something to us. They're products of the primary sector, not the things that we have you know, changed in uh, terms of their features or quality and made something else out of it. No, these are things that nature gave to us, right? So nature gave us wheat. Of course, you know, wheat was given to us in this form. We have done a little bit of dehusking and everything. Wheat is a commodity. The bread that we make out of it or we make so many items out of wheat, you know, we may make buns, we may make rotis, we may make cookies. All of these are not commodities, they are products. And our focus is going to remain on commodity. Then, you know, nature gave us so many spices. India is known for the spices that are grown here. These spices are commodities, but when a company like Catch or a company like MDH purchases those spices and, 
you know, brands them, packages them, advertises them, then they don't remain commodities, they become products. Similarly, you know, there are all things like India is a big export of castor seeds, groundnut, you know, so all of these oil seeds, mustard seeds, these are all examples of uh, commodities. They're all oil seeds, various kinds of oil seeds that we have, safflower seeds, sesame seeds, soya bean seeds, sunflower seeds, mustard seeds, you know, these are commodities, but when they are crushed and they're made into oil and then that oil may be, you know, fortified with vitamin A and blended with some other oils and then packed and then branded and then advertised and then promoted, all those things, then it becomes a product. So today our focus is going to be only on commodities. Products are a different uh, way of dealing with altogether. So we are only looking at commodities. Now, basically, you know, when we talk about agricultural commodities, agricultural commodities can be of various types. I mean, sometimes you would not even believe that these are agricultural commodities. For example, you know, the first thing that might come to your mind is agricultural commodities are grains like wheat or corn or rice or pulses like chana dal or urad dal or tur dal. Oil seeds that we have just seen in the previous slides, like soya beans or castor seed. Then spices that we also saw in the previous slide, like jeera, pepper, and, uh, you know, India is a big export exporter of all these spices. But then even meat, uh, you know, uh, that uh, like live cattle or feeder cattle or pork bellies is, uh, is a part of agricultural commodities. Then dairy commodities like milk or butter. Again, India is, a, is the world's biggest export of milk. Soft commodities, we call them soft commodities as a, a generic term, which includes things like cocoa, coffee, sugar, or orange juice, you know, and then other miscellaneous commodities. So one category to include all the remaining agricultural commodities like rubber or wool or lumber, which have very big uh, global markets in which they are traded. So uh, these are all the various types of agricultural commodities that we have. Now, if we talk about, you know, the most common agricultural commodities we deal with in India, which is grains or oil seeds or pulses or spices, they are grown on a farm by farmers or, um, you know, they could be fishery items by fishermen and then they may be going for processing. Uh, so there are aggregators who will buy the commodity from the farm and then send it, sell it to the processor or uh, they may be purchased directly by the processors. They are manufacturers, uh, you know, like beverage companies that will buy uh, the, uh, I, I mean, the sugar mills, which will buy the sugar cane and make sugar out of it. And beverage companies that will buy the sugar and uh, make beverages out of it. Then there are distribution uh, companies, distributors, include importers as well as exporters. And then domestic trading companies, they could be retailers who run supermarkets online as well as in the physical format. Um, they could be re, uh, restaurant owners. And then there are end consumers like you and me. All of them are stakeholders in the agricultural value chain. All of them are affected by the ups and downs of commodity prices. So if I'm a farmer and I've grown something, uh, you know, I'm going to harvest wheat in April, have wheat I have already sown in November and if the price of wheat crash in April then I will suffer a major loss. On the other hand if I am a um, and I buy wheat to make flour out of it and the prices of wheat rise sharply then there will be a loss to me. So basically speaking we can understand as if you are in the present in the value chain as a seller you are concerned about falling prices. If you're present in the value chain, your position in the value chain as a stakeholder is that of a buyer, you are concerned about, uh, about rising prices. And if you're an intermediary who buys from one side and sells on the other side, then you're concerned about both rising as well as falling prices. You know, for example, let's say you are an exporter. If you're an exporter, you could have two ways of exporting. One is when uh, the commodity is brought to the markets at the time of harvest, you buy it because that's the time it's the cheapest. So you buy it and stock it, right? And then you uh, look out for export orders and then a commodity that you have already bought and stocked, 
you try to export it or to sell it even in the domestic markets. But first you buy and stock the commodity, then you sell it, right? In which case, if the prices of the commodity fall, then the value of the inventory you're holding or the stock you're holding will decline, leading you to a loss. Another uh, way you could be a trader, could be an exporter, could be that you first receive an order to uh, you know, supply something. So you first wait for the order to come and then depending on that order, you go and buy from the market. In, in which case, when you receive an order, you have to give a confirmed price that this is the price at which I'll fulfill the order. In which case, if the prices rise, then you will have to go and buy uh, the commodity from the market at higher prices. That will lead you to a loss. So if you are a um, you know, if you're a trader who buys on one end and sells at the other end, then you're exposed to both the risk of rising prices in some situations and falling prices in some other situations. So uh, the whole um, challenge, the reason why we are sitting here today and discussing this issue is because there has been a dramatic rise in crop prices over the last 10 years or maybe even the price rise started in uh, you know around 2006 or something like that and this has led to an unprecedented level of volatility in the agricultural markets so the the uh, in india because of the kind of globalization that the indian economy has uh, been going through uh, the volatility in commodity prices that is there at the global level has not spared India also. So even in India, um, agri-commodity prices and the prices of other commodities also uh, have seen a lot of price volatility matching the kind of price volatility that has been there at the global level. So all the stakeholders who are uh, participants in the agricultural value chain are exposed to uh, the risks that come out of that price volatility. So uh, like I just said, it could be farmers, it could be processors and consumers, it could be traders, exporters, importers, all of them are exposed to losses, even banks. So you suppose a bank has uh, you know, taken a warehouse receipt uh, for wheat as a collateral and extended a loan against that then the value of that collateral can decline if the prices of the commodity uh, of prices of wheat fall. So there are risks for everyone who's involved in the agricultural value chain in whatever way. So, uh, you know, just to uh, just to tell you the, the volatility that is present in agricultural commodity prices, what I did was I uh, pulled out the prices for the last 10 years for corn. Just see the volatility, how the prices of corn have been volatile uh, i pulled, pulled out the prices of soya beans you know these are corn is a very very major input for um, companies like uh, who make you know cereal breakfast cereal kellogg or bagri's cornflakes in india or you know uh, companies that make popcorns companies that make buy corn and make snacks based on that corn corn is a very major input for them and if the prices of corn rise they will suffer for, uh, on account of it if the prices of corn fall then the farmers of corn will suffer because they are expected to earn a higher price the same goes for soybeans soybeans are a very important input for uh, you know so many companies that make soybean based products and oils the prices have been extremely volatile and the volatility is expected to continue because this year we expect that the global production of soybean will be uh, at least 10 percent less than the global demand so the prices are expected to rise sugar prices we all know can be quite volatile and so uh, when you are faced with such volatility in uh, the prices of the commodities which are common commodities which are bought and sold in very very large quantities that have huge markets in which these commodities are traded it is but natural to ask the question well do we have some way to be able to manage this volatility that is there in the commodity prices if i am uh, you know a, a stakeholder in the value chain how can i protect myself against whatever is inconvenient for me rising prices falling prices, whatever is a source of whatever constitutes an adverse price movement for me, a price movement that does not um, augur well for my prof profit margins. How can I protect myself against a price movement in that direction? So uh, that is what uh, we are going to discuss in the uh, session we have today.
Now, before I can begin, I need to give you this, uh, you know, very important understanding about commodity markets. See, commodity markets are important because that is where, uh, you know, if you are a farmer or a grower of or a producer of a commodity, you will bring your produce uh, to that market to find the buyer. So it is in the commodity markets that all the elements of commerce, which is the commodity that is to be sold or purchased, the seller, the buyer will come together. And it is th it is in these markets that price discovery will be done on the basis of demand and supply. And so, you know, if recently we've been seeing uh, so much agitation against the farm laws, a part of it is to do with how the commodity markets will work for agricultural commodities. You know, till now, uh, generally speaking, I will not, uh, you know, say that for every commodity that was the case, but for agricultural commodities, farmers were required to go and sell their output or their produce in the mandi designated for them. Now it has been said that uh, according to the farm laws, if they are to be implemented, the farmers can sell to in the mandi if they like, but they can also sell outside of the mandi if they like, if they're getting a better price there. So uh, that is where the entire, uh, you know, uh, unhappiness or uh, confusion is arising from. So that tells us about the importance of uh, these agricultural commodity markets, because for the farmers, it means this is where I will be going to sell my produce. So that's what is the importance of commodity markets. So in the commodity markets, the commodity producers or the growers get rewarded for the investment of money and time and effort they've made for growing that commodity. It could even be if it's an agricultural commodity growing it, but if it is something like copper or iron ore or coal or, uh, you know, uh, gold, then for mining that commodity. And this is where commodity buyers will come to procure the input that they process or add value to for creating the goods and services, right? So uh, a farmer will come to the commodity market to sell. Uh, the wheat that he grows, a uh, Shakti Bhog will come to the market to buy the wheat that uh, they need to buy. So th that's the importance of commodity market. So it's not necessary that the farmer will come himself and Shakti Bhog will come themselves. They can be coming there through their brokers or they can be many, many uh, links in the chain between the farmer and the processor before the commodity changes hands. Now, what is more important for everyone who's attending this webinar today is to understand is that uh, commodity markets take two forms. One is the spot market. We all know about spot markets, also called cash markets or physical markets. In the spot market, the commodity is brought by the seller for selling and the buyer comes for buying. So they negotiate a price. Uh, that is determined by the demand and supply prevailing at that point in time and the uh, uh, you know the transaction happens on a delivery versus payment basis which is to say the seller delivers the commodity and the buyer makes the payment for it so these are spot markets so you know if you if you are um, let's say you run a um, you know a food processing uh, unit you make chips right or you make corn um, you know some corn snacks whatever if you have a food processing unit and you go to the mandi to buy uh, corn or potatoes whatever it is then that is the spot market you will pay the money and you will pick up the commodity that you want so the price that you will pay for the commodity that you're buying will depend on the demand and supply at that point in time so it can you know keep fluctuating uh, in the morning the price or something else in the afternoon it can be quite different so it depends on when you're going to the spot market to buy and uh, the trades that happen in the spot markets are called spot trades it's called the spot price per quintal to buy a potatoes that's called the spot price now people who come and trade in the spot markets are those who are actually involved in the uh, value chain you know so the growers the farmers or the processors or the potato traders whoever so these are people who are actually dealing with the physical commodity they are picking it up from one place keeping it in a storage selling it or processing it but they're actually involved in the, um, uh, you know, buying and selling of the commodity. They're not doing that as a financial transaction. They're doing that transaction actually. 
these are the spot markets now the problem with the spot markets is that you can never predict the price that you will get to buy or sell something at in the spot market you know like i'll just give you an example um reliance industries limited today you know the prices went up a lot i'm talking about not a commodity but an equity share in this so uh, the prices went up a lot so 2047 so i said okay let me sell at 2047 because my buying price was less and i could see a profit i sold at 2047 after some time i see that the price has become 2065 and there is a regret i have that the price has become 2065 if i had waited i could have sold for 2065 per share right now this is the the spot market for you you don't know what is going to happen to the prices at the next moment they can move up sharply they can move down sharply and so uh, you're always exposed to uh, the risk of an argument in the spot markets now the question especially for those commodities whose prices are very very volatile is there a possibility that if i know i have to buy or sell something at a later date i can lock in the buying or selling price today and you know be free from the risk of up and down movements in prices right so the transaction has to be done at a later date i am going to go to the market deliver uh, the commodity as a seller or take delivery of the commodity as a buyer and make the payment so i'm going to go do that transaction at a later date you know maybe a month later two months later six months later one year later but i know i have to buy that uh, that much time later but because there is volatility in the price of the commodity that i need to buy i don't know the price that i'll have to pay when i buy two months later or six months later is there a mechanism through which i can uh, you know fix the price today for buying or selling that i have to do at a later date and the answer is yes that mechanism is offered by the derivative markets so the derivative markets are markets which are specially uh, you know created for commodities where the prices are quite volatile and where it's very difficult to be able to predict what will be the price you know after some time so what you do in the derivative markets now let me tell you one more thing commodity markets can be you know divided into two types every commodity that nature gave us every commodity that has any uh, importance to us in our day to day lives will come and get traded in the spot markets that's a, a no denying the fact every commodity must come and get traded in the spot market because if someone is growing it that someone has to come and sell the commodity in the spot market right and someone is growing it because someone else wants to buy it so whoever is buying it must come to the spot market to buy the commodity so every commodity that is given to us by nature will be traded in the spot market but a few of those commodities that are uh, you know traded in very large quantities like corn or soya bean or sugar or wheat or chana or jeera or turmeric or castor seed you know such commodities which are traded in very large quantities so look, imagine if i am a you know if i am an oil mill if i buy oil seeds and uh, crush them and make oil out of it so let's say i have a you know uh, i make mustard oil imagine the amount of mustard seed i'm purchasing and uh, crushing it to make oil out of it and then i'm bottling it and selling it under my brand name so just imagine the amount of uh, mustard seed i'll be purchasing if the price of that mustard seed changes slightly uh, it will lead to a you know unexpected profit or loss for me if the price of mustard seed increases i cannot keep changing the price of my mustard oil you know to match the changes in the price of mustard seed so if the price increases it's going to cause me an un uncalled for loss so especially those commodities that are traded in very large quantities and that are volatile in terms of their prices also come and get traded in the derivative markets so what are what is happening in the derivative markets the derivative markets are only there for a handful of commodities i am a handful but a, a few of the commodities uh, that are there in the spot markets maybe about 5% of the commodities in the derivative markets you don't do the buy, uh, delivery versus uh, deliver delivery versus payment transaction today you only fix the terms you only fix the terms today that at a later date i want to buy this quantity of mustard so i want to buy 10 tons of mustard seed 
this quality, so you define the quality because it's something that is given to us by nature. The quality can also quite be quite variable. So this quantity, this quality at this location on this date and let's fix the prices today. So what you're doing is you're fixing five contract terms today, but the actual delivery and payment will occur at a later date, at a future date. So they're also called derivative markets, also called futures markets. So the contract terms that you're setting today in the commodity derivative markets are quality, quantity, the location on which delivery must be, uh, uh, you know, affected, date on which delivery must be done and the price. So uh, then once you have entered into a contract uh, to fix the price at which delivery versus payment will happen at the later date called the settlement date, uh, you are in, you are protected against the volatilities in the uh, commodity price. Then the prices can go up or down. It doesn't matter. Your buying price is, uh, the, is the same for you. It's fixed for you. So the trades that are done in the derivative markets are called futures trades and the price is called the future price. But what happens in the derivative markets is participation in the derivative markets is also used to, is also now open to a lot of people who are not really involved in the value chain, who are not really involved in the buying and selling of the commodity like the processors or the exporters or the traders or the farmers or the end consumers. No. Even if you are a financial investor, which means you have a view on prices, you say, uh, you know, the price of mustard is going to go up. So let me buy it today and then sell it later at a higher price. Right. Even if you are just, you know, trying to make money um, out of the ups and downs in commodity prices, you can easily participate and, and make money in the derivative market. So that is the. Uh, that is the benefit or, or I mean, that is not the benefit, but that is the uniqueness of uh, of derivative markets. So what you must understand for the timing is commodity markets are uh, every commodity is traded in the spot market. And those commodities that are traded in the spot market and have very volatile prices and also have, a, you know, are demanded, bought and supply, bought and sold in large quantities will also be traded in the derivative markets. So the derivative markets are markets where a commodity is traded so that its price can be fixed today uh, and the trade can be done at that fixed price at a later date. So the contract terms are fixed today. Now, I don't see any questions in the, for the time being. So I assume that I can proceed uh, uh, without. OK, so Satyam uh, has a question, which is the regulator? OK, uh, very good question. Question Satyam, uh, does commodity market exist in international market and how does the market structure is different from Indian domestic? So. Uh, Uh, I hope you can all hear me. Colleen, can you confirm that you can hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ma'am, slides are invisible. Uh, actually, your screen is shared with your team's profile. And slides are not visible, right? Actually, uh, the Teams app is open. Kindly minimize the app, then slides will be visible. No, no, I opened the Teams app because I wanted to see the questions if any had come. So, um, for the agricultural spot markets in India, the agricultural spot markets are regulated by the states under an act called the Agricultural Produce Marketing Committee Act. So, Spot markets for agri commodities are regulated by APMC Act, which is a state subject. Okay. And the derivative markets are regulated by. SEBI. The derivative markets are regulated by SEBI.
so uh, the derivative markets are regulated by sebi right now uh, the other question is so internationally the commodity markets do exist right uh, uh, the general structure for the commodity derivative markets across the world is the same uh, which is that there will be a commodity exchange on which uh, the commodity exchange will uh, you know design the derivative contracts that are be, that are to be traded on the exchange platform and uh, across the world the uh, format is the same so there will be a commodity exchange or there may be a stock exchange like national stock exchange of india or the bombay stock exchange which have commodity derivative platforms on their exchange right so in india mcx and ncdex the multi commodity exchange and the national commodities and derivative exchange are out and out commodity derivative exchanges out and out commodity derivative exchanges regulated by sebi but in addition to that sebi has given permission to the national stock exchange and the bombay stock exchange which are actually equity stock exchanges to also run a, a derivative platform for commodities these two exchanges also regulated by sebi now globally it is the same thing except that sebi doesn't regulate the uh, you know commodity exchanges outside india so the oldest commodity exchange in the world uh, for agricultural commodity anyway it is the oldest commodity exchange in the world is the chicago board of trade cbot it was set up in 1848 in chicago in the us and today it is owned by the chicago mercantile exchange cme so that is regulated uh, by uh, the commodity futures trading commission of us then you have many other commodity exchanges around the world uh, they follow the same format which is like stock exchanges uh, the structure of the commodity exchanges around the world is the same to name a few big commodity exchanges of the world i said cbot the chicago board of trade you've got the nymex which is not an agri commodity exchange it is more an exchange for um, energy commodities you've got lme london metal exchange which is again not an agri commodity exchange but a very major exchange of the world for um, uh, industrial metals you've got the tocom which is the tokyo commodity exchange you've got uh, two big agri commodity exchanges in china are the zhengzhou and the dalian commodity exchange in india the two big commodity exchanges are mcx which is about 90% of the market share in india and ncdex which is a national commodities and derivatives exchange which is actually an agri commodity exchange uh, but unfortunately in india the agricultural derivative markets are not so uh, you know not so deep and liquid they do not have much participation they do not have the same level of activity that you see uh, for uh, metals or for energy commodities or that you see on overseas exchanges i hope that answers the question of satyam okay now what are derivatives so we said what are traded in the derivative markets are uh, cont derivative contracts contracts to buy or sell a commodity at a later date but at a price agreed today so derivatives are contracts they are not the asset itself they are not the commodity itself but they are contracts to buy or sell an asset which is called the underlying asset uh, which in this case is a commodity but you could also have derivative contracts on equity shares you could have derivative contracts on currencies you could have derivative contracts on interest rates uh, you could have derivative contracts on weather you could have derivative contracts on freight rates and now for your information uh, the chicago mercantile exchange has also launched derivative contracts on water okay so uh, water is the uh, asset which is going to be traded at a later date but the price for trading it is fixed today so there are contracts to buy or sell a commodity an asset at a future date but the price is agreed to this the so whole objective is to lock in the price today and be protected against the volatilities in the prices so the quality 
the quantity, the delivery date and delivery location are a part of the contract. So it's not just the price that is agreed today, but you also agree on what will be the quality, what will be the quantity and the location and date for this delivery. So uh, these derivative contracts that are traded in the derivative markets can be negotiated directly between the buyer and the seller. You know, so the buyer and the seller can meet face to face, uh, sit across the table and negotiate the contract or they can negotiate it telephonically if they have a long, uh, you know, long standing business relationship. Then these contracts are called over the counter contracts, OTC contracts. OTC contracts are customizable because they are, you know, uh, they are negotiated between the buyer and the seller. The uh, terms of the OTC contract are completely, uh, you know, can be completely decided bilaterally, uh, mutually between the buyer and the seller. Or they can be, uh, these derivative contracts can be listed and traded on an exchange. Like I just said, exchanges like Chicago Board of Trade or TOCOM or NCDEX, they can be traded on an exchange, in which case they're called exchange traded derivative contracts, ETD or XTD derivative contracts. When derivative contracts are traded on the exchange platform, then in order to make them tradable, uh, you know, across a large set of participants, they are standardized. You cannot allow participants who trade derivative contracts on the exchange to customize the terms of the contract. So the terms of the contract are standardized. And not only that, the exchange has a key associated clearing house, you know, just like banks have clearing, uh, clearing facilities. A check that you deposit in a bank will be, you know, first checked, uh, you know, verified that everything is correct in the check. Only then the amount will be debited from the check writer to the name, uh, a person whose name is written on the check. So same uh, happens with an exchange. The exchange is backed up by a clearinghouse and the clearinghouse makes sure that the uh, parties, the counterparties, who buy and sell a contract on the exchange platform are not exposed to any kind of a risk. There is no counterparty risk that there is uh, that is possible on the exchange. So the exchange is a regulated platform, uh, regulated by SEBI and self-regulated by um, the uh, exchange rules and regulations in the clearinghouse. So this is the kind of derivative contracts that. Um, are uh, you know traded this is the objective with which they are traded now there are four different uh, if you like types of derivative contracts that uh, we can uh, think about one is the forward contract a forward contract is not traded on the exchange it is over the counter so i can uh, you know if i am uh, if i have a uh, order to export, you know, uh, 10 tons, not 10 tons, 10 tons is a very small quantity, but f uh, 1000 tons of castor seeds to, uh, uh, you know, a buyer in Japan in, uh, say, end of uh, March. Okay. And I don't yet have the castor seed with me. What I can do is I can, before I quote a firm price to my um, uh, buyer in Japan, I can ask a uh, uh, castor seed trader locally, uh, you know, in in uh, maybe in Gujarat or wherever that castor seed trader is located in Rajasthan, saying that look, I need to procure 1,000 tons of castor seed for the purpose of export, but I'll buy it only around uh, you know uh, second week of March because I have to export it in the end of March. So what will be the price you will give me these 1,000 tons of castor seed in the second week of March? OK, so you can enter into a contract with the castor seed trader. You are an exporter and you can enter into a contract with the castor seed trader that I'll buy later for you, but let's fix the price today. And so you're fixing the uh, quantity as 1000 tons, the quality as whatever quality is required for export purposes. The date as second week of March, the location as you can say, well, that it has to be delivered to my, uh, you know, uh, uh, to this this place where I will do the grading, sorting, packaging for export and, so, and the price can be fixed today. So you can say, okay, 4,200 rupees per quintal 
is decided then when i buy on second week of march whether the price is 4400 or 4000 per quintal you have to give it to me at 4200 rupees a quintal that's a forward contract a futures contract is you say i cannot trust anyone or i cannot find anyone who can supply me with the castor seed at a later date and there is an exchange like uh, ncdex in india which is willing to uh, which which is listing contracts on castor seed what i can do is i can rather than buy uh, or enter into an agreement to buy from the trader over the counter i can buy the castor seed contract from ncdex today and fix the price at which i'll buy at a later date so in this case i'll be buying a contract for march in, i'll go to ncdx exchange and i'll buy a contract for march the price at which i buy the contract today is the price that i have fixed for uh, buying castor seed at a later date the only uh, thing now is when it's a, a futures contract which is listed on an exchange i am not able to customize the quality the quantity the location and the date i have to make a few adjustments to my own uh, uh, you know uh, buying schedule or quality or whatever and uh, fix the price by uh, accepting the terms of the contract as they are listed by the ex by the exchange what the exchange in turn will do is it will try to design a contract such that that contract is Uh, common it's the it's the most common variety of castor seed that is traded it accommodates a few ups and downs in quality so but the contract that is designed by the exchange is designed in a manner to be acceptable to at least 80 85% of the market participants there may be few market participants who want a very unique variety of a commodity they may not want to use this contract but for the largest number of participants in the market the contract should be quite close to what they really want to buy or sell uh, actually so in a way you can think of a futures contract as an exchange traded version of a forward contract uh, maybe i can try to show you uh, you know what a castor seed contract looks like so look at this this is a castor seed contract on ncdex right so they have actually worked out all the all the quantity is 5 tons so one contract means you agreeing to buy or sell 5 tons right the date on which this contract is uh, for which this contract is entered or on which this contract will be settled uh, is the 20th of each month so you will get a contract for 20th of monthal and uh, uh, the location will be any one of these places so the location will be men mentioned uh, uh, disa disa is the most common disa is a mandi in gujarat or bhabar kadi patan so these are the locations right so th and the quality will also i think network quality is bad i'll use a dongle dongle as so i think uh, i'm not sure but probably my network quality is bad so i'll just switch on to a dongle so the this is exactly what a um, futures contract will look like it will look like a pre decided standardized kind of a contract where the quantity the quality the date and the location have been fixed the only thing that you need to negotiate is the price right so this is a futures contract which is nothing but an exchange traded version of the forward contract and i will encourage all of you to go to the website ncdex.com or mcxindia.com go to uh, products under that website 
and look for any kind of a futures contract that you are interested in knowing more about. Then you've got options contracts. Options contracts are, um, you know, an improvised version of a futures contract in the sense that what you do as a buyer is for a later date, you lock in a buying price, but you're not under any obligation to buy at that price. You say, you say, look, if the price in the market is higher, then I will buy at this price. But if the price is in the market is lower, then I am free to go and buy from the market at the lower price, right? So that's a, uh, an option contract. If you're a seller, what you can do is you can enter into an option contract to sell something at a later date at a fixed price. Now, the beauty of the option contract is that if on the date that you're going to sell uh, that this contract is settling, if the market price is lower, then you don't have to sell at the lower market price. You can sell upon the uh, sell at the agreed price. But you're not under any obligation to sell at that price. If the price in the market is higher, then you say I'm free to go and sell in the market at a higher price. So that is an option contract. But of course, such a you know best you, you're getting the best of both worlds you're getting protection against an unfavorable or adverse price movement while still having the opportunity to buy or sell at a favorable price doesn't come free it comes with a cost so when you uh, enter into an option contract and uh, fix the price at which you'll be able to buy but you can buy at a lower price if it prevails in the market uh, or fix the price at which you will sell, but you can sell at a higher price if that prevails in the market. Then for this, you have to pay a premium. There's a premium, so that's an added cost, the premium that you have to pay. And then you have a fourth category of derivative contracts, which are called swaps. Now, swaps are not seen in the agricultural commodity world. Swaps are most commonly seen on interest rate um, when you know uh, they used to fix interest rate movements uh, they've used to fix the ups and downs in the currency exchange rates in the commodity world swaps are only seen on crude oil so what is a swap a swap is where you enter into a contract with a counterparty right that uh, let's fix the price at which I get to buy. Let's say if you are a buyer, you're worried about rising buying prices. Let's fix the price at which I'm going to get to buy for the next 12 months or the next six months, whatever the time you fix for. I'm going to do several rounds of buying. So let's say you are, uh, you know, you need to buy potatoes every 10 days because you make potato chips. You, you know, you make and sell potato chips. So you need to buy potatoes every 10 days. And every time you go to buy potatoes in the market, the prices have uh, changed. Sometimes they're very high, sometimes they're low. But when they're high, they call, you know, they cause you a lot of inconvenience. When they're low, it's a surprise, uh, you know, uh, profit for you. But you are more comfortable with stable prices of potatoes. So what you can do is you can enter into a contract with a counterparty, which is not usually your seller of potatoes, but a more, more often a financial counterparty. It could be a hedge fund. It could be an investment bank. It could be any such risk taker who says, look, I will guarantee you a, sell, a, a buying price of potatoes of 800 rupees a quintal, right? So for the next one year, for the duration of our swap contract, you can go and buy potatoes from the mandi from which you always buy. If uh, in one purchase visit, in one of the 10 days that you go to buy, you pay 900 rupees a quintal, I will compensate you 100 rupees a quintal so that you pay 900, you receive 100 from me, your net buying price is still 800 rupees a quintal. But if in one round of buying, you go and you end up buying potatoes at 700 rupees a quintal, then you will have to give me 100 rupees a quintal so that your net buying price is 800 rupees a quintal. So whatever happens, your net buying price will remain 800 rupees a quintal, right? Sometimes I will give you money to compensate you because you paid a higher price in the market. Sometimes you will give me money to compensate me because you paid a lower price in the market. But net-net, the swap actually is a derivative contract 
through which you exchange floating or variable cash flows for uh, fixed ones. Okay, so you say I don't like the cash flows to be volatile because they can take away my profits. So this contract allows you to uh, do this. Now these, so this is what what you see on your screens is what derivative contracts typically achieve for you. So now, or maybe you can say today, you enter into the derivative contract by fixing quality, quantity, delivery location, delivery date and price for a trade that you're going to do at a future date. That's why it's called a futures trade. And you, the basic objective is you lock in a price for the future trade, okay? For a later trade. Now, when that date arrives, you execute the trade as per the contract. Okay, uh, I think I uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so there is a question from Ambarish saying so the website details are mcxindia.com. That's one website. That's for Multi Commodity Exchange of India. The other website you can go to is ncdex national commodities and derivatives exchange .com. These are the two websites which will give you a very good idea. OK, and you need to spend some time. You need to be a little patient with, uh, you know, getting an idea of these contracts. Then, um, uh, OK, which we can so you can track the futures in India through these websites. It's, you know, uh, if you uh, spend some time, you will become very, very uh, comfortable with, with understanding this. My suggestion to you is if you're dealing in agri commodities, then you look at NCDEX. But if you're dealing in commodities other than agri commodities, then you go to mcxindia.com, right? And you should be able to, everything that you want to know is given on the website. If requ required for uh, you to be able to use those derivatives, uh, you can, uh, you know, look at some of the uh, learning resources they have on their website. Otherwise, you can, you know, you have books available in the market. You have my book, you have manuals. The broker who you are using to do the trading of uh, whatever trading you're doing will also help you in this um, in this activity. So what is uh, uh, a derivative contract? You enter into the contract now and at the later date, when the date that you've agreed for the settlement or uh, completion of that contract arrives, you complete the contract, the contracted trade or the agreed trade, the derivative contract uh, that you have entered into, either through cash settlement or through physical settlement. Now, this is very important to understand either through cash settlement or through physical settlement. It's not necessary that when the date arrives, you say that, look, uh, the seller must deliver the commodity and the buyer must make the payment. That is physical settlement. Physical settlement is when the seller, seller gives the commodity and the buyer gives the money to the seller. Sometimes you can just manage your risk through cash settlement. You say, let's fix a price. And then depending on whatever the market price is when the contract is settled, if the market price is higher, then the seller will give the money to the buyer. 
if the market price is lower then the buyer will give the money to the seller but net net at the time of settlement of the contract the uh, fixed price will prevail okay so the difference between the market price and the price that was contracted will be exchanged between the buyer or seller depending on uh, how the prices have moved that is called cash settlement what we normally see is when you enter into a forward contract which is an otc contract over the counter contract uh, the two counter parties the buyer and the seller will do physical settlement so the most common method of settlement is physical settlement but when you do a futures contract on the exchange so the futures contract is an exchange traded version of a forward contract when you enter into a futures contract on the exchange then most of the times you are more keen on uh, cash settlement rather than on physical settlement and the plain and simple reason for that is that uh, when you go for physical settlement through the exchange the exchange will offer you a very limited number of locations Uh, as you saw in the cast a seat contract it will offer you very limited number of locations through which you can give or take delivery okay and those locations may not be convenient for you you may not want to give or take delivery from those limited locations they may not be convenient locations for you you would have your own choice of locations or the date on which the exchange uh, contract will be uh, able to give or take delivery may not be uh, a right date for you so you will use the exchange traded derivative contracts mostly for cash settlement so 98% of the times on an average exchange traded derivative contracts are settled through cash settlement uh, that is the main uh, difference but anyway both ways are possible cash settlement or even physical settlement so we have discussed about forwards futures options and swaps just now uh we now come to uh, the main part of what we have to discuss today which is hedging what is hedging now the term hedging comes from the term hedge you know something that you uh, grow around yourself you know if you live in a house maybe in a you know in a uh, house on the uh, on on a piece of land then you will create a hedge around your house because that hedge acts as a protective a uh, mechanic it be, gives a protective boundary so that no one can just easily invade your property right so that's where the term hedge comes from and the futures markets or the derivative markets as we have understood them by now their primary function is hedging they allow a buyer of a commodity to fix a buying price and the seller of a commodity to fix a selling price and then not to be worried about if you are a buyer what happens if prices rise i am not worried if you are a seller what happens if prices fall i am not worried because my buying and selling price is fixed so hedging is a technique that allows uh, the hedger which could be a buyer or a seller to basically be protected against unfavorable uh changes in the price of the commodity so because prices of commodities can be very volatile uh you know that's the assumption when the price of the commodity are not volatile there is nothing to worry about so the price of salt are not volatile you don't have to worry about what will happen if i need to buy 6 months later i need to buy salt what will happen to the price of salt so if you look at someone like who's a snacks manufacturer you know like maybe uh, haldirams or maybe mccann or maybe bikaner they are snacks manufacturers they are not concerned about salt prices because salt prices are not volatile they are concerned about the prices of things like uh, sugar or things like uh, you know um, uh, flour wheat flour or things like almonds because the prices can be volatile so uh, whatever commodities the prices are volatile for you don't have to worry about unfavorable price movements a rising price if you're a buyer a falling price if you're a seller is what is an unfavorable price movement because uh, through hedging you able to lock in a fixed buying or selling price so what you really do is look now again something important for you to appreciate is that when there is a volatility in commodity prices the risk will remain right uh, it's like energy you know uh, it cannot be destroyed energy can only be uh, the form of energy can be changed 
right physical energy can become electrical energy electrical energy can become light energy but uh, the energy cannot be destroyed the same thing happens with uh, price risk or price volatility volatility if it is there in the prices of a commodity it will remain hedging allows those people who don't want that volatility to be able to pass on that volatility to someone who says i can take that volatility so you know you know, if i am a speculator i may want to take the risk of volatility in commodity prices to make a profit out of it but if i'm a hedger you know my main business is to make snacks or my main main business is to be involved in exports then i don't want to be concerned about price volatility that's something that acts as a nuisance in my business and so i want someone else who's willing to take that volatility uh, uh, to take it up so what hedging allows me to do is it allows me to transfer the risk that arouse, arises for me out of volatility in commodity prices to my counterparty who most probably will be a speculator who is willing to take that uh, volatility so um, in hedging all you do is you take a position in the derivative or the futures market by buying or selling a futures contract and so locking in your buying or selling price and therefore protecting yourself against any kind of a price volatility so it's very simple actually you know let's say you are a uh, you are a, a snacks manufacturer and you need to buy uh, maybe flour maybe sugar maybe potatoes maybe oil you need to buy it every 15 days or every week or every 10 days or once a month depends on how big uh, you know a uh, facility you have and how much storage is available with you and what your buying practices are a lot of factors but you need to regularly buy your inputs right now if you need to buy something at a later date you know that it will be a problem if the prices rise so what you can do is you can buy a futures contract now and lock in your buying price okay so hedging is do now in the futures market what you need to do later in the spot markets if you need to go later on in the spot markets to buy something sugar potato whatever you buy the sugar contract or the potato contract in the derivative markets today so do today or do now in the derivative markets by with you know futures contracts what you need to do later in the spot markets if you need to buy later in the spot markets buy a futures contract today if you need to sell later in the spot markets sell a futures contract today so what really happens is if you have if you need to buy something at a later date and you buy a futures contract right let's say uh, the price of a uh, castor seed futures contract for march is 4400 you buy a castor seed march contract at 4400 and that 4400 price is logged in for you now if the prices of castor seed rise right then as a buyer uh you have you going to suffer a loss because you'll have to buy at higher prices cash as it prices have risen but you've bought a futures contract and when you sell it okay uh you will be able to sell it at a higher price and you will make a profit so what you're doing is if you can appreciate it now if not uh, you will appreciate it a little later as i go forward what you're doing is you are Uh, you when you need to buy or sell something in the spot market you exposed to the risk of rising or falling prices respectively you go to the derivative market and take on another risk by uh, you know through the futures contract you take on one more risk deliberately that risk that you take in the futures market is negatively correlated it's the opposite of the risk that you face in the spot market so it's something like portfolio diversification what is portfolio diversification i should try to have uh, you know uh, investments in two assets which move against each other you know so normally we find that when the equity markets are not doing well when the stock markets are not doing well gold rises we saw it very recently during the pandemic time how much the gold prices had gone up because the stock markets were not doing well but when the stock market started doing well especially after the budget of 1st february you know the stock markets shot up when the stock markets started doing well the prices of gold started following so um, 
you know what we say is to to have a safe investment portfolio you should keep some of your money in um, equity shares but you should you should also keep some of your money in gold so that if equity shares come crashing down at least gold will rise and your portfolio will not crash right hedging is exactly like portfolio diversification if you are facing the risk of rising prices in one market you should go to the other market so if the spot market risk is rising prices the risk you should take in the derivative of futures market is falling prices and if the risk you face in the spot market is falling prices you should go to the futures market and take a risk of rising prices that is what thing is all about and i want to tell you of uh, you know the uh, the and um, you know something that goes hand in hand with hedging which is speculating you can cannot go to the derivative markets and hedge unless someone is willing to speculate speculators bring the much needed liquidity into the market speculators are uh, the ones who are present in the market as risk takers they say look risk will be there because prices of commodities will be volatile because uh, cr- prices of commodities will be volatile because they are given to us by nature and so nature can play its role in uh, you know uh, if the weather is bad the harvest will be lower so or you know suddenly corn may be demanded for making biofuels and the demand may rise so pri- prices of commodity will be volatile that we cannot help but if it is causing you an inconvenience you can pass on the volatility problem of commodity prices to us so speculators are very important counterparties to hedgers but we are not talking about speculating we are talking about hedging today however i do want to spend 2 minutes to tell you about he- uh, speculating speculating is you do not have a position in the spot markets okay so unlike uh, Uh, you know a haldiram or unlike uh, you know a beverage company that buys sugar to make beverages you do or unlike an exporter who needs to export castor seed to japan you do not need to buy or sell anything in the spot markets to begin with you're not exposed to commodity price risk you don't have to worry about the prices of castor seed rising or falling the prices of oil rising or falling the prices of sugar rising or falling the prices of flour rising or falling that's not your concern but you say okay if there is volatility in commodity prices i have an opportunity to make profits so what you do is you don't uh, go to the derivative markets or the futures markets to protect yourself against any kind of risk arising from price volatility you go to the derivative markets to take a risk and the risk you take is based on your price view so very simply speaking if you expect the prices to rise you will buy a derivative contract now you'll buy a futures contract now and then when the prices rise you will sell it at a higher price and make a profit and if you expect the prices to fall you will sell a futures contract now and if the prices fall you will buy it back at a lower price and make a, a profit right if your price view is correct you can make big profits but if your price view is wrong then you can make big losses okay so what you will appreciate here is the hedger is going to the derivative markets because the hedger is actually exposed to a risk and he is going to the derivative markets to cover that risk the speculator is going to the derivative markets to take the risk so let's try to you know take a risk and try to make some profit out of it so uh, the speculator's objective is quite different from that of the hedger the hedger wants to concentrate on his main business and a uh, give away price risk the speculator wants to take that price risk and make profit out of it so if you like in a way the speculator's main business is to take risk and make profits out of it so speculators could be individual traders i am a speculator every uh, i speculate in the uh, commodity markets but more than that i speculate in the equity markets so every thursday like today is a very important day because i trade in uh, index options okay then there are trading firms like say futures first which is a trading firm which trades in commodities um, just to make a profit out of it in commodity futures rather portfolio managers hedge fund managers all of them uh, are uh, important speculators in the uh, futures markets their biggest importance their necessary evils right their biggest role is while they may you know by their presence cause some volatility and some unwanted price movements in the derivative markets 
uh, they have to be kept under check. They have to be a lot of, uh, you know, close vigilance on them so that they don't hijack the markets. But they're necessary evils. You can't wish them away from the market because they become the counterparties to the hedgers. If you told, if you said, no, it is a rule that only hedgers can participate in the derivative markets, no hedger would, you know, or a very few hedgers would find a counterparty. But uh, speculators are very important participants. They bring liquidity to the market and they take away the risk that the um, uh, speculate, uh, the sorry, the hedgers are trying to give away. Now, on this slide, uh, I have created a, a table which helps you compare speculators with hedgers. But I think, uh, you know, I have discussed all of this. So this should, uh, you know, there should be no need to read through the slide because I want to, you know, move on to discussing um, the the uh, uh, you know the way hedgers will use derivative contracts for protecting themselves against price volatility. One important uh, point here is a hedger. You know, let's say I am an exporter who needs to buy castor seed in the second week of March because I have to export the castor seed to a Japanese buyer in the end of March. I uh, so if I've got the or a confirmed order today, today is 11th February. If I've got a confirmed order today, I'll buy a March uh, March futures contract of castor seed, and I'll hold on to it till I actually want uh, till I'm actually ready to buy castor seed from the spot market. So I will hold on to my derivative market position till. I am uh, going to buy or sell the commodity in the spot market. But speculators don't hold on to their positions for so long. Speculators will uh, create a position in the morning, close it by the end of the day, exit the position by the end of the day. If they've bought a contract, they'll sold it. Uh, they'll sell it by the end of the day. If they've sold a contract, they'll buy it back by the end of the day. They'll exit their position within a day or within a few days. They don't keep their positions open for very long. Now, I have a small uh, another table here which should you know further clarify uh, what kind of risk which participant faces and uh, then we'll go on to discuss how they will go to the markets for hedging. So when other uh, spot market is used by someone for buying at a later date like an airline company will buy jet fuel at a later date a beverage company will buy sugar at a later date. A bicycle maker will buy steel at a later date. You know, they can't, an airline company is always buying jet fuel. A uh, beverage company is always buying sugar. A bicycle maker is always buying steel, right? Because they, it's a regular input for them. Then we say their position in the spot market is short. They're short of something. They need to go to the market to buy it because they're short of jet fuel. They're short of sugar. They're short of steel. Um, you know, a miller, a wheat miller will always buy um, wheat. He's short of wheat. Um, uh, you know, a, a toothpaste manufacturer, Colgate, Colgate Palmolive, will always buy menthol because they're short of menthol, which is an important ingredient for um, uh, for making toothpaste. An exporter will always buy uh, whatever commodity he's agreed to export. So a spice exporter will always keep buying various kinds of uh, spices to export. Their position in the market is short. So when you need to buy something, your position is said to be short and the risk you face is the risk of rising prices. When you are the producer of a commodity, you, you need to sell that commodity. Once it is ready, you need to sell that commodity in the market. Like if you're a wheat farmer, you will sell the wheat in April. If you're a sugar mill, you're selling the sugar you're producing. If you are, um, you know, um, um, if you are a company uh, like Cargill who purchased a lot of rice when it was harvested, you will sell the rice in the market. So when you own something that you will sell at a later date, your position is said to be long, long. Something belongs to you so long. And then when you own something which you'll sell at a later date, your concern is what if prices fall? I'll have to sell that commodity at a lower price and that will lead me to losses. So your risk is the risk of falling prices. Okay, so I've got a small, uh, you know, summary of what I've said to said so far. And I am sure this will resonate with all of you with uh, the discussion that we've done so far, a farmer or a farmer producer organization, which actually is a company of a lot of farmers, 
who has sown a crop right now you see wheat has been sown it's not yet been harvested or grown a crop is said to belong the commodities although the farmer does not yet have the wheat with him or her the farmer will still be said to be long the crop or a trader even an exporter who's bought the commodity and is stocking it to sell it at a later date hopefully at a higher price that's what the business model is a stock and sale business model is you buy something first stock it to sell it at a later date that's what cargill does that's what louis dreyfus does that's what trafigura does they are also long the commodity and exporter who holds inventories and is looking for export orders is also long the commodity all of them face the risk from falling prices the risk they face is the risk that comes from falling prices but if you are someone who and we come to the right side now if you are someone who needs to buy the commodity because uh, you may be a processor who buys the commodity to process it and value add to it or you may be a trader who has a buyer you know so there's a buyer there's a haldiram who's come to you saying i need to buy potatoes will you supply me potatoes after 10 days and you say okay i am a potato trader but right now i don't have a ready inventory of potatoes with me so i'll need to go and buy potatoes from the market to supply to haldirams so in which case you're short potatoes and you will need to buy potatoes from the market you could be an exporter your export order is there with you but you don't yet have the commodity with you so the price of the export order is fixed but the price at which you'll buy the commodity could be higher than the price at which you've agreed to supply that will lead you into a loss in the export order so in these cases you face the risk that arises from rising prices so when you're long the risk is falling prices when you're short the risk is um, rising prices now what will you do when you uh, are short when you need to buy something uh, when you need to sell something at a later date so i'm sorry i said short what would you do if you are long a commodity if you need to sell something at a later date so if you are a, a you know something like a farmer just let me see if i'm connected and if there are any questions i'll just take a small short uh okay so yes good i took a break because nikhil has a question uh uh nikhil a very good question what if the output of farms is low a very good question and i want to answer it in some time uh and the second question is that means so you're talking about speculating that means one of them will lose money is it not similar to gambling yes nikhil if you like to say that it is similar to gambling it is but there are many means of analysis we can use to be able to uh, make an informed uh, decision to buy or sell so in gambling it is totally based on luck but in speculating it is based on analysis so when i decide to buy a contract because i expect prices to rise or when i decide to sell a contract because i expect prices to fall i'm not doing it on the basis of luck i'm doing it on the basis of analysis or of information that i have collected and i know that there's a lot of uh, you know uh, possibility that prices will uh, will fall because the acreage under cultivation is lower the weather has not been favorable there's a huge demand that is coming from um, a number of countries uh, there's a new use that has been found for the product so the demand is there but the supply this year is going to be low so i expect the prices to rise and therefore i should buy a contract today and when prices rise i'll sell it at a higher price so it is not similar to gambling because i'm using some very uh, scientific analysis if you like uh, to be able to make uh, my uh, decision to buy or sell so it's not quite gambling but yes um, the risk of loss is still there um, the second question you have asked is what if the output of farms is low that's correct nikhil uh, you know the, when the output changes especially you know you say it's yield risk the output of the farms could be low so let's say you know just to explain it to you nikhil let's say that i am a farmer and as a farmer i have uh, you know uh, i expect that i will be harvesting uh, 20 tons of wheat on my farm my expectation is i'll be harvesting 20 tons of wheat on my farm and so i am worried about in april when i sell my wheat 
in the mandi uh, the price of wheat may be may be lower okay so what i do is when i sow the wheat you know I, and my expectation is 20 tons i sell uh, contracts so uh, for your information the quantity of like you saw the quantity for a castor seed contract was 5 tons the quantity for a wheat contract on ncdx is 10 So I'll sell two contracts. That will become twenty tons. Okay, I sold two contracts. I logged in a selling price of maybe twenty two hundred. Weather was bad or whatever happened, and actually I harvest only twelve tons of wheat on my farm. That's the yield risk. When I harvest only twelve tons of wheat in my farm, then I have a problem. then i have a big problem because there i am uh, i so i have sold 20 tons but what i have to sell in the spot markets is only 12 tons that can lead to a problem therefore nickel in order to handle such a situation if i were to advise such a farmer that you if you expect to grow 20 tons of wheat on your farm don't hedge yourself for the complete 20 tons Okay, hedge yourself for about fifty to sixty percent of it only. Even the biggest hedgers in the world, you know, Southwest Airlines. So this is outside of the agri commodity markets, but Southwest Airlines, an airline company of the U.S., is called the king of. why the network quality is so bad today okay can can someone just put a yes if you can hear me yes ma'am now you are audible um southwest airlines which is called the king king because they have used hedging to some have suffered losses so even when their competitor airline companies have suffered losses okay i am sorry for that uh... so even when uh, so 
what I'm trying, Nikhil, I'm trying to answer the question, what if the output on the farm is low? No hedger ever hedge 100% of their buying or selling requirement because uh, the quantity I'm really sorry for this, uh, you know, this I've got three connections with me today and my geo dongle somehow is acting funny. You know, it keeps saying action needed, not a very tech savvy person to be able to correct, but I'm sure you can hear me now. Ravi, you can hear me. Nikhil, just give me a yes, please, if you can hear me. So because you, thank you. So because you cannot be sure about, you know, for, for reasons that are completely outside your control, because you cannot be sure about how much you will be uh, taking to the market to sell later or how much you will be ending up buying later, it is always safer to hedge yourself for, uh, you know, 50 to 60 percent of your total requirement. OK, and leave yourself open to the remaining to open to market risk. But even if you hedge 50 to 60 percent of your total buying or selling requirement, you would still be uh, protected against losses uh, to your profit margins. So if you need to sell something, selling hedge mechanics is what I'm discussing now, which is if you need to sell something at a later date. How do you go about hedging your selling, uh, you know, yourself against losses if selling prices were to fall. So now today when you identify that there is a, you own a commodity and you will be needing to sell it at a later date. So once you're sure that you have a commodity to sell at a later date, you should sell a futures contract corresponding to the date of sale in the spot market. Say if I'm a wheat farmer and I'll be selling wheat in April, you know, there are some wheat farmers who say, no, my harvest will only be ready in May. I'll sell it in May. So you have to identify what is the date on which you will be selling in the spot market. You sell a futures contract corresponding to that date of sale. So those two things have to go hand in hand. Uh, you know, simultaneously two actions have to be taken. When you commit yourself to selling something at a later date, you sell a futures contract corresponding to the date of sale. And then when your, uh, you know, production is ready and you're going to the market to sell, you go and sell your uh, whatever you have to sell in the spot market, right? Rather than selling on the exchange, you sell in the spot market and you square off your futures contract. So if you sold a futures contract, you buy it back, right? Why I'm saying uh, you square off your futures contract rather than deliver on the exchange is because the locational issues and the timing issues. Even the quality issues sometimes may come in the way. But as a normal practice, I would not advise you to look at the possibility of giving delivery on the exchange platform against the futures contract you've sold because uh, the delivery processes through the exchange are uh, cumbersome and demanding and uh, you may end up with a bad delivery. So it's always better to sell in your regular spot market. So what happens is, this is the fear, right? What if prices fall? So look, I have a re very regular, very standard 
matrix out here not matrix but axis out here this line shows the price prices can move down prices can move up over a period of time but by buying a futures contract you have fixed the price here right uh, i'm sorry by selling a futures contract you fix the price here right and this line the vertical line shows the profit or the loss you uh, can uh, take on your position so let's say i need to sell wheat i need to sell wheat at a later date i need to sell wheat in april so what i'll do is i'll sell a april wheat contract okay now i don't have a say in the price at which the april wheat contract is trading so maybe the april wheat contract today is trading for 2100 rupees it could be trading for 2050 it could be trading for 2200 whatever is the price at which the april wheat contract is trading i have to first look at that price and say does that price appeal to me if i am able to sell at the price at which the april futures contract is today trading on ncbex will i be happy will i have profit so if that is the case you so wheat on the uh, assurance that you will be able to sell your wheat in april at the price that is indicated by the ncdx wheat futures contract today so you sell the ncdx wheat contract uh, for april and you sow your wheat two things you do parallelly now you just you know take care of your wheat let the crop grow you harvest it in april you take your wheat crop to the market we are assuming here that uh, you've hedged around um uh, Are my slides completely not visible, or are are they like I, why I am doing this in a uh, you know in the I'm close I'm making them smaller is because uh, I want to be able to see if I get disconnected, right? So I'm depending on Colleen now to tell me if uh, I get disconnected. Okay, so I'll be watching. I'll be depending on her to tell me if uh, if you can't hear me. So what you do is. in april you take your wheat to sell in the uh, mandi whatever mandi is designated to you right so let's say i am a farmer in uh, karnal and i take uh, around karnal and i take my wheat to sell in karnal mandi now if the prices of wheat have fallen this is this is a price line right if the price of wheat have fallen then in the spot market i expected when i sowed my wheat in november i had looked at the ncdx wheat price for april and used that as the guidance that i should be able to sell at this price hopefully that was the assurance on the basis of which i had sown wheat now the price of wheat in the market has fallen so i end up with a loss i take my wheat to the spot market prices have fallen i don't quite get the price that i had expected to get when i saw the april wheat futures contract which i sold but i had sold the april wheat futures contract at this price right because prices have fallen the price of this futures contract has also fallen i buy it back at a lower price and i make a profit i buy it back at a lower price and i make a profit so i make a loss in the spot market but because i sold the futures contract i buy it back at a low price and i make a profit in the are you people not able to see my slides Are you able to see it now? Are you able to see my slides now? Are you still not able to see my slides? 
what is the reason for this okay just give me a moment let me try to up upload my slide one more time able to see it now are you able to see my slides now saying action needed connection is really bad most of the rush to the sense possible listen it's not right very bad connection close okay let me uh, upload one more time yes nihar i will just guess i will just answer your question no it was this is not at all because of futures trading uh i'll try to say, share my slides one more time colleen is very kind enough she's saying that are you able to see my slides now Colleen, I've shared the slides with you. Please come to slide number twenty. Ma'am, have you mailed to me? I've emailed. I've emailed. i've emailed okay so what happens is that the price that which you sold a futures contract is the price that is logged in for you if you go and sell your commodity at a loss in the spot market that's because the prices have fallen the prices of the futures contract have also fallen because the important thing here is when the prices of wheat are falling not only do they fall in the spot market they also fall in the futures market the two contracts move in a tandem with each other the spot market and the futures market but if the prices of wheat have risen okay then this is this is an unexpected uh, happening for you you know if the price of wheat have risen then uh, you can go and sell your wheat at a profit in the spot market but the profit in the spot market will not be for you to keep because you have sold a futures contract and the price of the futures contract has also risen and so when you buy back that futures contract because you want to quit your position there you cannot leave that position open then you have to buy back that contract at a higher price and you will have a loss there so this is how it uh, it works uh, colina are you able to have you got my slides
Okay, so Colleen is just sharing the slides and then we'll come back to it. So. Uh, the important thing for you to be able to construct a decent hedge is to be able to identify that the commodity that you are selling in the spot market or going to sell later in us in the spot market its prices move in a strong correlation with the prices of the futures contract at least 80 percent correlation should be there if that correlation is not strong enough then hedging does not uh, make any uh, sense for you. So that is a very important pre-requirement for hedging. Of course, one prerequisite for hedging is that the contract for that commodity should be available on the exchange form. And the second one is that the prices of the futures contract should move in a strong correlation with the price of the commodity in the spot market. If that happens, then you'll be able to achieve a very good hedge. Of course, uh, a little bit of extra profit or loss in one of the two markets will be there, but it will be much better than remaining completely exposed to price risk. Now, till Colleen can uh, upload my slides, I want to answer Nihar's question. So around uh, uh, you know, May of uh, 2020, the prices of uh, oil in the US markets had become negative. They had become negative. The prices of, of oil had fallen into the negative territory because uh, of the because of the pandemic, you know. So there was a, a lull. There was an economic slow when economy slow down. Uh, the demand for crude oil reduces. Um, when the demand for crude oil reduces. Uh, you know, and there is production coming, the prices tend to fall. Now, what happens with, uh, you know, crude oil production is, Nihar, I hope you're listening, that uh, production is very, you know, drilling of crude oil, if you stop it, to restart it is very, very expensive. Okay, so every supplier wanted to not stop the drilling of crude oil. But in the US, uh, the storage space for crude oil was exhausted because there was no demand. Nobody was picking up the crude oil, right? The MCX uh, contract of crude oil is linked to uh, the US contract, right? The NYMEX contract. So it was reflecting the behavior of prices of crude oil in the US markets. Now, uh, what was happening in the US is there's not enough storage space but the producers are going on producing crude oil because they don't want to stop production. So what they're saying is if there is a buyer who is willing to pick up the production of crude oil from uh, our uh, wells, then we will pay him money to pick up the crude oil. We want to, because the suppliers or the producers of crude oil had figured out that uh, to stop production and to restart it after a month would be more expensive than to continue our production and uh, pay pay a buyer to pick it up. Now, what some uh, oil tra traders did in this situation was they uh, received money, they took the crude oil, and they hired some very large crude carriers. You know, they're called VLCCs very large crude carriers. They hired very large crude carriers for six months. Uh, some of them hired it only for four months. Some of them hired it for eight months, but they hired very large crude carriers and the oil that they were picking up from these um, uh, drillers, they were storing on these very large crude carriers and they had put the very large crude carriers onto the sea, onto the high seas, saying that our crude carrier is on the high sea. And whenever there is a demand, wherever there is a demand for crude oil from, we will direct our ship in that direction. OK, so they were hoping to uh, make big profits out of it. Uh, one is they were receiving crude oil along with money. And two is that they were uh, hoping that soon the demand will revive and they'll be able to sell the crude oil that they're storing on VLCCs at uh, very high prices. So this was, uh, so to answer Nihar's question, it was not because of speculation on uh, MCX, it was because of the mismatch in demand and supply in the US markets and absence of storage space. Nihar, your question answered. 
Now, Colleen, can you uh, please put slide number 20? Can everyone see slide number 20? Yes, everyone can see slide number 20. So what I've shown in slide number 20 is how a seller would, um, you know, would, would uh, construct the hedge at the time of making the decision to produce or grow a commodity and at the time of uh, selling the commodity, the hedge will have to be deconstructed. Now, Colleen, please move to the next slide, slide number 21. If there is a fall in the price of the commodity, then indeed the seller will suffer a loss in the spot market. The seller will suffer a loss in the spot market, but because the seller has sold a futures contract, Due to the fall in the price of the commodity, the seller will be able to buy back the futures contract at a lower price and make a profit in the futures market. So the loss in the spot market will be compensated by the profit in the futures market. Right? I will not say exactly compensated. Sometimes the uh, profit in the futures market may be more than the loss in the spot market. Sometimes it may be less. But it will be a very small difference between the profit or loss in one market and the loss or profit in the other market. However, if you know uh, by uh, by a stroke of luck, the prices of the commodity in the spot market rise, then there is an unexpected gain uh, when the seller sells the commodity in the spot market. There's a gain. The profits have uh, the prices have risen. But unfortunately for the seller, the gain will be uh, taken away when the seller squares off the futures position. The price of the futures contracts would also rise and uh, there will be a loss in the futures market. So um, if it is wheat, let's say that the price that the uh, seller has logged in is 2200 rupees a quintal. Now, in April, when the seller uh, uh, actually goes to the markets to sell, if the price is 2100 rupees a quintal, the seller takes a loss of 100 rupees per quintal, 2200 min uh, minus 2100, 20, 100 rupees a quintal in the spot market. But the contract that was sold for 2200 cannot now be purchased for uh, 2100. This is called cash settlement, actually. Uh, and uh, the seller will gain 100 rupees per quintal over here. But from the 2200 fixed price, if the market price is 2300, then the seller has an unexpected profit of 100 rupees per quintal in the physical market or in the spot market. But when he buys back the futures contract that he sold to cash settle it, uh, the price of the contract is now 2300. So he has a loss of 100 rupees per quintal in the futures market. So the uh, good part is that in the case of an adverse price movement, the seller does not suffer a loss. But the bad part is that when the prices rise, the seller is not able to enjoy the freedom to sell at higher prices. And this is precisely where option contracts are helpful. If the seller had used an option contract, and to be more specific, if the seller had purchased a put option contract, then uh, the seller would have the freedom to sell at the uh, contracted price if the market prices fell, but would be also free to sell at the higher market price without any obligation to sell at the contract price if the market prices went up. But in the futures contract, this is not possible. So what we've seen here is actually how a selling hedge will work with a futures contract. Okay, now Colin, please move to slide number 22. Uh, this is slide number 22 is how uh, a buyer, someone who needs to buy a commodity at a later date and is exposed to the risk of rising prices would construct a buying hedge. 
So this slide shows you buying hedge mechanics. How will uh, a buying hedge work? So now, uh, so suppose you are Haldiram and you know that I need to buy uh, sugar every 15 days. So when you recognize the need to purchase a commodity at a later date or at later dates, uh, you know, several rounds of buying every 15 days, uh, you say, fine, I will continue to buy the uh, commodity as and when needed. But parallelly, corresponding to the date of purchases, every every time that... So, it, actually, you must be clear on what are the dates on which you're going to uh, purchase or sell. That's a requirement. So, corresponding to the date on which you'd be purchasing sugar or whatever commodity it is, you buy the futures contracts corresponding to those dates, Right. Now, when you go to the markets to actually buy the commodity, right? You buy the commodity from the market because you need to buy it to, uh, you know, to start processing it or to export it or to do whatever. Uh, but uh, the futures contract that you had uh, bought, you can now sell it. So, you know, in, in both the situations, uh, you can... Uh, in both the situations, you can see that we are doing in the futures market what we need to do at a later date in the spot markets. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, Mandar, you can write an email to me and I will give the slides to you for sure. Okay, I'll give you the slides. No worries. Okay, so uh, that is uh, what is happening in both the cases. That when you need to sell something at a later date, you sell a futures contract corresponding to the date of your sale. When you need to buy something at a later date, you buy a futures contract corresponding to the date of your purchasing. So. Uh, buy the commodity from the spot market when you need to buy it because you need to use it in your production process or you need to export it uh, and you need to prepare for the exports and you square off you close out your futures contract by selling the contract you had bought on the same exchange as which at which you had bought so what happens now is uh, you know quite different suppose this is the price let's say you need to buy sugar uh, your haldirams and you need to buy sugar let's say once a month Okay, so you have fixed the buying price for say the next month. You fix the price for March at 3500 rupees a quintal. Now, when March comes and when you go to buy the sugar from the spot market, if the prices have risen, which is your primary concern, because rising prices constitute an adverse price movement for commodity buyers, if the prices have risen, you will, of course, have to, you know, uh, buy sugar at a higher than expected price and you will have a loss in buying sugar. But when you sell your contract, the contract you bought, when you sell it, you will be able to sell it at a higher price and make a profit. So the loss you take by buying sugar at a higher price in the spot market is more or less fairly well compensated by the profit you have when you uh, uh, um, sell the futures contract that you had earlier purchased uh, but the same story again if unexpectedly the prices of sugar fall you are able to you know as a as a, a matter of uh, you know uh, unexpected movement you're able to buy the sugar at a lower price than you expected you would be able to buy it at so you have an unexpected profit in the uh, buying of sugar from the spot market but you will not be able to enjoy this profit that you, that accrues to you because of uh, being this uh, you know this uh, drop in the price of sugar and unexpected profit to you because you have bought a futures contract and now you will have to sell it at a lower price and uh, you will make a loss in the futures market so in, in net net uh, the profit or loss you have because of the unpredictable movements in the spot market is compensated by uh, an almost equal loss of profit in the futures market. 
okay and uh, so it does sound a little uh, you know um, it does sound very happy to be in a situation where a loss is compens a loss in the spot markets is compensated by a profit in the futures market but if you had a profit in the futures market i'm sorry if you had a profit in the spot market that profit being eaten away uh, because of your futures position is not a very uh, happy situation to be in now uh, option contracts can also be used by you okay the benefit of option contracts is let me tell you uh, when when i'm discussing option contracts let me tell you in the indian commodity futures markets option contracts are traded on very few commodities so the choice of option contracts is not there on cast seat the choice of option contracts in the agri markets is only there on wheat maize and mustard seed just three commodities wheat maize or corn and mustard seed only three commodities have option contracts but if option contracts were available and I expect they'll be available in the near future you can also use option contracts for a similar kind of hedging if you need to buy something at a later date buy a call option if you need to sell something at a later date buy a put option okay so what we have discussed today uh, you know the time does not allow us to discuss hedging with options but if you understood what we have discussed today understanding hedging with options will be uh, very simple for you when you uh, buy a call option uh, it's different from buying a futures contract a little more advanced than buying a futures contract because by buying a call option you are able to uh, it's much better you know you able to lock a maximum buying price you able to uh, put a cap to your buying price but if the prices in the market fall you are free to go and buy from the market at lower prices okay for which you have to pay a premium you know to get this advantage and when you buy a put option you are able to put a floor to your selling price which means if prices fall you don't have to sell at lower prices you have a minimum selling price fixed for you but if prices rise you have the opportunity to go and sell at the higher prices open to you okay again you have to pay a premium so option contracts end up being more expensive than futures contract because of the involvement of a premium but the freedom to buy at lower prices if prices fall or to sell at higher prices if prices rise remains open to you okay so what we have to uh, understand in summary is that the risk of volatile prices can be managed uh, in the derivative markets or in the futures market by using otc as well as by using exchange traded derivative contracts both of them can be equally well used for managing the risk that buyers and sellers and traders of commodities face uh, because of volatile commodity prices uh, futures contracts like we have just seen uh, can be used to lock in an assured future buying or selling price so one price is locked in for you and beyond that if prices rise or fall in your favor you are not able to take advantage of that but option contracts allow you to take advantage of favorable price movements while still protecting you against adverse price movements for which you have to pay a premium however in the indian commodity derivative markets option contracts are not yet uh, uh, traded uh, colleen i am on the last slide of my on slide number 25 uh, or slide number 24 so op slide number 24 so option contracts are not yet traded on most commodities in the indian uh, commodity derivative markets so option contracts the choices available for hedging with option contracts are uh, as yet limited right so with that i come to the end of my presentation i am sending my email id uh, on chat for those of you who would like to write in to me to receive uh, the presentation i don't know if it will be shared with all of you that i'm not sure of but you can write an email to me just tell me that you were a part of my webinar and i'll send you my slides that and uh, you can also uh, you know uh, if you want to look at this uh, subject further you can look at my book called commodity derivative markets and 
derivatives authored by uh, me. Okay, that will also help you and uh, uh, help you uh, know more about this subject. So that's my email address and you are you're welcome to write to me if you want the slides. So any more questions so you can put it in the chat box if there are any more questions. Okay, okay, so I think it's over.